Kentucky Health addresses the health care concerns of all residents of Kentucky and surrounding states. It was created by Dr. Wayne Tuxen, a colorectal surgeon practicing in Louisville. Here is your host, Dr. Wayne Tuxen. What happens when someone gets shot? Yes, there is this outpouring of grief over the loss of a life. We all mourn. We go to comfort the family of the individual. We go to funeral services for the person who got shot. We mourn, we have a vigil. Some people vow vengeance against this harmful act that has occurred, and some of us vow we're gonna stop the killing in our communities. Yet there are other consequences. There is the cost of health care, the impact overall on the community. These are the things which we too often don't really appreciate, how a gunshot can affect the overall health of all the rest of us who weren't shot or may not even live in that neighborhood. There are problems. We have limited health care resources, limited dollars, limited hospital beds. What happens when people who get shot are taking up these beds? Are they, can they afford the beds? Do they, and I don't want to sound like some crass, cold-hearted individual, but if I have a heart attack, which is not something that I brought upon myself, should I be denied access to hospital care compared to someone who is arguably is involved in a preventable act, the shooting of someone else? These are the things we want to try to talk about and see how these events affect us all. Again, we may not be the ones who get shot, but all of us are affected by the gunshot, even though it wasn't aimed at us. With us today, we have two guests. Dr. Bill Smock, who's a professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Bill, thanks for being here. Thank you, Wayne. And Dr. Ricky Jones, who's a professor in the Department of Pan-African Studies. And again, Ricky, thank you for being with us again. Good to see you again. Now, let's, let's get down to it. And Ricky, let me ask you, is a gunshot a health care issue? Clearly it is. It's a health issue and it's a health care issue. Um, and, and we're going to look at costs. Hopefully we'll look at costs across the board in this. Obviously you have the, the threat to life, mm -hmm. uh, quality of life, absolute loss of life, and then you have people who are being injected into all kinds of systems, the criminal justice system as well as the health care system, and there are only so many dollars to go around to all of those. So it's, it's easily and clearly a health care issue in all communities. Bill, from the emergency room perspective, I guess you have a much better, a more acute view of it than the rest of us do. How do you see it? Oh, this is a tremendous public health issue, particularly in Louisville, where we're having at least one incident of gun-related violence a day, sometimes more, particularly on weekends, we may have two or three that come into University Hospital. Mm -hmm. And it takes up the resources of the physicians treating the, the patient, and then once they get admitted, <clears throat> taking up hospital beds, and then the the issue of cost. It, it is a tremendous um, problem because most of these patients are uninsured that come in, and then who pays for their care? Mm -hmm. Now tell me, what kind of injuries are we talking about when we really speak about violence uh, that you're seeing there? When we talk about gun-related violence, it could be anything related to a shooting. Mm -hmm. It could be an accidental shooting. It could be an assault, obviously an intentional shooting. Mm -hmm. It could be a homicide. And the difference between an assault and a homicide may just be a half an inch. Um, if that bullet hits an artery, mm -hmm. then it could be a homicide. If it misses it and goes through the liver and they can pack the liver, then it would be an assault. Um, we have suicides. We have suicide attempts. Um, so there are so many guns out there in the community that that's why we're seeing so many of these events every day uh, in Jefferson County. Well, you mentioned that. Are these handguns, shotguns? Assault rifles, what kind of things do you see? 95% are gun or a handgun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, and it ranges from the Saturday Night Special to, you know, kind of high, um, high velocity, but, but high caliber uh, handguns that make carry 15 mm -hmm. rounds mm -hmm. in them. We have very few shotgun injuries, although we did have an incident uh, recently with someone was going around shooting someone with a 12 gauge. Uh, but they're in the minority, and then we only have one or two high-velocity rifle rounds, assault rifles, every year. So it's, you know, 95, 96% handguns. What about the cost of this to the community? Because you brought that up, but when we talk about the cost, what kind of dollar figures do you see when you're talking about someone who gets shot? It all depends on where they're shot. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the data from 2008 and 2009, it's millions and millions of dollars. In 2008, it was $18 million. That was just the acute cost from their initial visit to University Hospital. Mm -hmm. That doesn't include the cost to send the person to rehab mm -hmm. or the, to purchase their wheelchair or to purchase 
whatever equipment they're going to need to continue their life for how many years are left. In 2009, it's actually going to be higher than $18 million. Um, and some of these victims, it averages about $43,000 per victim when we take all comers. But some of those victims kind of skew those numbers that may cost over a million dollars in acute costs when they are paralyzed, when they're on a ventilator, when they require multiple surgeries. So it's a tremendous drain on the health care dollars, because of the limited dollars that we have uh, locally to spend to take care of indigent care. That's a lot of money on the back end. Can we prevent some of this? Is it cheaper for us to try to prevent this stuff? Well, and that's the big question for me. A lot of times when we talk about costs, we're mm -hmm. just talking about the money that you know we put into to the systems after people are injured in, in the, these, this way or other ways. Mm -hmm. what, what my center here in Pan-African Studies, the Center for the Study of Crime and Justice in Black Communities looks at are the links to not just violence, but life failure across the board, education, poverty, we look at issues of recidivism, race, of course, gender, all of these things are how they tie in. So when we talk to Bill and they got $18 million, you know, just a university hospital, if I'm not mistaken, what, last year for these types of injuries, what if we poured that type of money into education on the front end? Mm -hmm. You know, and what type of life, life chances does that, does that offer poorer people in the country? I would imagine, and I know we're gonna look at some statistics, or hopefully we mm -hmm. will, about race, gender, class, all of these things and how they tie into these injuries. And I guarantee you there, there is some type of, of salient link that we can see. It, would that not be true? Oh, definitely. And it, wouldn't it be wonderful to take $18 million and pump that into prevention? Yeah. <laughs> to, and if we look at you know, where are these individuals being shot, mm -hmm. um, what time they're being shot, who is doing the shooting, and <clears throat> who are the victims? And if we can target those preventive programs to that population, if we know, for example, that it's between, it's African-American males between 18 and 28, account for the majority of the assault victims, how do we help them remove themselves from a situation where they're going to be shot? You know, is it being in the wrong place at the wrong time, or are these individuals putting themselves in a position, in an activity, um, or in a location where they're more likely to be shot? Um, but it's, it's certainly a waste of money to spend um, it's certainly not a waste of money, but it wouldn't be nice to, to mm -hmm. take that money and use it for preventive programs, public health programs, mm -hmm. uh, community programs, where we can, you know, keep people. If it just, if we could, if one person averages forty-three thousand dollars every time they come in, and if we can prevent, you know, ten people, that's mm -hmm. four hundred thirty thousand dollars that we would save, and that we could, I think, better spend in preventive programs. And we got to be clear. Uh -huh. We we, we got to be clear about that because I think we can simultaneously be clear and say, look, these are particular populations that are being affected mm -hmm. by these types of phenomena in our community, and not say that there's some, something intrinsically wrong with black males 18 to 28 years old who are, who are engaging in these types of activities. Mm -hmm. The key is that we dig into the core of exactly what's going on with the culture of these individuals and how it's developed and what we can do to impact it again on the front end so that we don't have to spend all of this money on the back. So what it caused cause for really is a flipping of the ideology of how we deal with these problems. And I know people like myself and Bill certainly would like to see that type of flip, mm -hmm. but it's tough to deal with this on the public policy side of the issue because it, it's a long-term thing. It's not, a, it's not an immediate fix. It seems, you know, uh, immediately as an intractable problem. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking to public administrators and public elected officials, you know, they, they don't want to deal with an intractable problem in a long-term way. Hey, man, they're running for re-election, you know, mm -hmm. next week or next month or next year. Sure. But, but you said it. I'm going to ask it. What is the wrong place at the wrong time? Is it sitting on my front porch? Is that the wrong place at the wrong time? Is it going to the grocery store in my neighborhood, the wrong place at the wrong time? Is it being at the playground, wrong place at the wrong time? How do we define that? It, it could be. You know, as, as you know, we've known one another for a while. I grew up in the projects of Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. The whole neighborhood is the wrong place, right? Mm -hmm. When we look at the hardcore numbers, especially along lines of race, these are some scary figures. African, almost a quarter of African Americans in this country are impoverished. Over a third of black children live in poverty. You know, there was this big hullabaloo before the economic downturn that, that we could not reach double digit unemployment in this country. Mm -hmm. Before the downturn, black unemployment was over 11%. Now black unemployment is about 16 and a half percent, almost 20% for black males. So we're talking about one in five black males are unemployed. So what happens when an entire pop, when a large percentage of an entire population of people mm -hmm. over time are cut off from avenues that this country see, sees as successful, right schools, right jobs, economic 
uh, um, stability, all of these things, the ability to build a family and take care of that family. What happens to these individuals when they don't see any way out in that? I think they turn to underground economies, alternate ways to define themselves as men. I think that's why you see the presence of handguns in so many of these communities. So yeah, you know, entire communities could be the wrong place. And I'm sure Bill would say, we, we, you got some people coming into these situations who, who have been shot mm -hmm. through no, no uh, behavior of their own. You know, they were simply there. They were simply there. And so what do we do with these people? I don't think we can follow this course of blaming the victim, even though we can say that this is a specific problem in certain communities. Mm -hmm. We got to seek to solve that problem but, and not but, demonize people. But, but, Bill, let me ask you something. How often do you see that same person who's been shot once, maybe twice, coming through the door again? Can you identify that individual? We can. Um, we see, in, every year, we see between 5 and 10 percent recidivism, mm -hmm. meaning that the, the individual that comes in shot has been shot before. We had one patient that on his fourth visit to the university hospital mm -hmm. in a three year period, for a gunshot wound, died. Well, he got shot four times in three years? Four times in three years. Jesus Christ. And he, when he would leave the hospital, he would get back involved in that same activity uh, where he put himself at risk for being shot. And unfortunately, uh, on the fourth time, he, he died. So between five and 10% mm -hmm. per year recidivism, which is, is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, what I would love to see, and, and what I've talked about uh, that, that's not funded, is that particularly when we see a young African-American, or it could be a young person come in shot, to bring a social worker into the emergency department mm -hmm. to work with that individual, work with the family, determine what happened, where, why were they there, how did they get shot, and are there resources in the community that we can give to that individual, give to that family to break that cycle so they don't come back again. Let, let me put a, uh, a face to this and perhaps ask maybe not a fair question to you, but Number one, who is it, and we've both talked about it, we've all talked about it a couple of times referring to the African American problem, but is this a truly an African American problem? And what would happen if this wasn't some individual from a disenfranchised portion of our society, the poor individual, person living out in a rural area perhaps, but someone of a higher socioeconomic status? Would we see more resources devoted to this kind of a problem? Um, tell, I me don't about, know. tell me about race. For who, who's know. this person that's getting shot on? Well, when we look at the, assault, the victims of assault and homicide, that is principally an African-American male okay. between the ages of 18 and 28. Mm -hmm. That's the assault, that's the homicide. When we look at suicides, that is a white male disease. Very few African-Americans suicide by gun. Mm -hmm. That's principally um, uh, when we plot and we actually take a map and we put the location where each shooting occurs. Mm -hmm. So we have the assaults, we have the homicides, we have the suicides, we have the accidental suicide attempts. When we look in the periphery of the county, that's where the, after the, the white male suicides. Mm -hmm. These are not, um, not in the downtown area. Um, when we look at where the assaults and where the homicides occur, that is principally in three areas. That's uh, the West End, 12th and Hill, and Newburgh. Those are the three kind of hot spots for the assaults. Um, and the locations that is uh, in the proximity of housing projects mm -hmm. uh, in those areas. Um, so that's who, that's where, um, and if we can you know, look at where this is happening, I mean, those are the places where we need, if we're going to put resources in. Um, when, with the suicide victim, and there's not much we can do about that. They've, mm -hmm. they've done the deed, um, and we can't prevent that. But I think we can learn from a psychiatric perspective, who are these people? Mm -hmm. Are there telltale signs that might give the family or a psychiatrist clues that this person is going to suicide? But then we look at the assaults and the homicide. When do they occur? How do they occur? Why do they occur? Um, and then apply those resources. I think you know, if we can prevent you know, a few of those cases, it would be wonderful. The problem is, what is how do we know that we've prevented 10 deaths? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's easy to say you know, it costs this much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's black and white. Yes. But to say, OK, if we start these programs, we've saved 10 people, and that's half a million dollars and a million dollars. That's much more difficult to prove. And when we're looking at limited resources, um, you know, how do you make that argument? Bill, longitudinally, what does that look like? Not, not to take over the no, whole, the whole no. piece. Longitudinally, have, have uh, homicides, assaults, and suicides gone up or down in the, in the last half decade, let's say since 2005, or have they, they remained steady? There's been a slight increase in the assaults and the homicides. Mm -hmm. Suicides are basically uh, level. Um, 
and the percentage is basically the same over the last uh, eight to ten years. Right. Just okay. a slight yeah. increase in the salt. Because I, I, would, I would imagine that they would go up a mm -hmm. little bit. Usually violent crime goes up a little bit mm -hmm. as the economy turns down. So, so some of the numbers I know are not probably available, you know, for late 2009, early 2010, but I would imagine this is probably going up a little bit. Yeah, but you touched on something earlier, though. You said the issue of manhood and different ways in which people manifest. I often wonder, too, what about just territorial control, be it for, you know, for, it may be bad, but this is mine, and we're going to control all activities within this area, or even for illegal activity, uh, the rise in narcotic use or what have you. Is that a factor? Again, these are underground economies, mm -hmm. right? So you have people who certainly have to deal dope, and you have other people who are caught in, in, in cycles of drug abuse. Usually people use drugs. I mean, you drink. I, you know, yeah, 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 you drink, I drink. Mm -hmm. But when you were in college, you drank a whole lot more probably. You know, and I went to the Naval Academy mm -hmm. before I went to Morehouse, and the unhappier I was, the mm -hmm. more I more drank. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, people who have addictions usually are trying to escape from something. Yeah. So if you have people yeah. suffering day to day, then certainly they're going to develop addictions. Mm -hmm. So in these neighborhoods, you are going to have more opportunity to benefit from that type of underground economy. You know, you're, you're not going to have the same type of presence in, in uh, uh, prospect. Mm -hmm. as you are in the West End right now. Because when you look at the ec economic layout of Louisville, certainly the, the economy hits people in the West End harder than it does folk in Prospect. So you're gonna have probably more drug abuse, probably not prescription drugs because mm -hmm. folks don't have uh, as much access to it, but you're also gonna have more violence. And when you talk about manhood, mm -hmm. I mean, talking to young black males mm -hmm. and figuring out how they define themselves as men gets very, very interesting sometimes. You know, you get in our circles and people are gonna debate, you know, well, I went to Harvard, I went to Yale, I went to Morehouse, I went to Howard. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor. These are bragging rights, whether people really want to admit it or not. I belong to this fraternity, mm -hmm. I belong to that one. But when you talk to this segment of society, they don't have access to those things, so what are they gonna brag about? How are they going to define themselves mm -hmm. as men? And what's gonna make them desirable to women who are in their circles? It's a very different type of culture which you know, very few of us know about both worlds. Some of us do, like you do, I'm, and I'm sure you do now, Bill, because you've been exposed to this. And, and so you know, I think it's incumbent upon us to try to bridge those gaps. Break it down for me, if you will, though. The mindset of an individual uh, in terms of dominance, control, and how that short, small segment of our population has such a huge impact in a negative way. Manhood for many of these people is defined by the ability to dominate and control. And a handgun is the tool, is the, is the tool of choice for many of these people to assert that dominance. Now how it affects everybody, mm -hmm. it certainly affects the people who are getting shot, mm -hmm. who are getting killed, it affects the people who love them, it affects potential mates mm -hmm. that may want to construct a family unit with these people, and it also uh, affects children that these people may leave behind. You know, and it affects the economy that affects all people. So it's an, this incredible ripple effect in all communities when we talk about how people are defining and identifying themselves as men. You know, and so it, it's, it's very complex mm -hmm. and it's not something that we're going to solve tomorrow. Bill, is there a, a timing to how violent or gunshot injuries may take place? Uh, or is it fairly random during the course of a week, a month? or a year or anything like that? It's, or is there some specific times you can see this? When we look over the course of a week, mm -hmm. uh, basically it's the same. Sometimes we see more shootings on you know, Friday night, Saturday night, but it, it varies. I mean, there, we may have a, a Friday night where we have four victims come in mm -hmm. all at one time. Um, one shooting, then a retaliatory shooting, and they go back and forth. Um, but uh, overall, it's, it's stable. We will see, as I said, you know, more than one gun-related incident a day. Mm -hmm. Um, and some some years, you know, it's Friday night. Some years, it's Saturday night. Some it's Sunday night. Um, and actually, some it was a Wednesday for mm -hmm. um, one one year. Wednesday happened to be the the most frequent day. So, so there is no you, you really can't tell all the time. No, no. That's uh, scary. At least one a day. Yeah, more wow. than in Louisville. That's, in in two thousand and eight, there were four hundred and thirty gun related incidents. 430, so more than one a day. Now, I got to tell you, though. Maybe when, Louisville is the wrong place <laughs> at the wrong time. Right? Well, when I left Washington, D.C. in 1994, and that year we had 486 murders 
murders. So I can't tell you the number of times that people missed. But what was interesting, uh, a lot of times, some of the people who were not killed but were injured, they weren't, in, the intent was not to kill that individual, but rather was to maim. So shoot a person in the knee, uh, shoot a person, put a gun up the anus and blow out the rectum knowing they'd have to have a colostomy. Are you seeing this kind of a thing? And what are some of the ancillary impact of these gunshot injuries in terms of what we're seeing in our young people now? I don't, when I interview those, those victims, I don't see um, a instance of, of maiming, intentional maiming. Mm -hmm. I think it's shooting, it's, um, you know, they're shooting and they hit what they hit. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the, the consequences, particularly of those individuals that survive, uh, if the bullet penetrates their spinal cord mm -hmm. and so they're paralyzed, if uh, we had one just this past week that was shot in the face and got his internal carotid artery, so now he's paralyzed on one side of his mm, body. Mm. Um, and that individual will be a financial burden to society for the rest of their life. Millions and millions of dollars will be spent on home health care, wheelchairs, um, and that you know, doesn't even enter into the initial hospital costs, which will be in the hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars for for that one individual. How old are these people, typically? Uh, the, we look at all ages. Suicide is the, um, someone 55 and older, mm -hmm. generally. The assault victims are 18 to 28, some into the, their mid-30s. But the majority of the assault victims are 18 to 28. Hmm. So, <laughs> why aren't we all up in arms? You know, we have walks for breast cancer, walks for colon cancer. We're talking about lung cancer disease. We talk about lymphoma. We talk about non-cancerous diseases. Where is the uproar for gunshot and violent injury? Well, because I think the majority, e even though these numbers are stark and, and they're very disturbing, they don't directly affect us all. You know, my, my grandmother died of, of cancer mm -hmm. last year, of multiple myeloma, Sorry. the woman who raised me, right? And before she uh, was diagnosed with cancer, even mm -hmm. though cancer was all around me already and it was affecting uh, millions and millions of people, mm -hmm. I never thought very much about cancer. You know, it, but once she was diagnosed with it and I started to have conversations with folk, you know, almost everybody I talked about either has had to deal with it or knew somebody sure. that's had to deal with it. It's like getting a new car, right? The car's already out there, yeah. but you start noticing the cars that are yours. So a, a, a good majority of people in our country have not been directly affected by gun violence. If, if they were, I think there would be a, a greater outcry uh, about but some Ricky, type of a, a Let me ask you though, um, we talked about the cost on health care, trying to get into a hospital, but people don't want to come downtown. Do they want to come downtown just because of traffic or are people worried about their safety? Well, but, but I think some of that fear is, is misplaced, too. Mm -hmm. I, I think we still have a whole lot of racial animus and racial suspicion in this country, even though we have a black president now, you know. And, and so there's this incredible tension, and you see this across the board with so many different things that, that are happening in the city, you know, from folk not wanting to, to travel to certain parts of, of the city, mm -hmm. all the way to JCPS's desegregation plan. Mm -hmm. You know, a return to neighborhood schools really is a return to segregated schools, and that's what some people are fighting for, mm -hmm. because when you look at the demographics of Louisville, this city still pretty much looks like it did in the, in the mid-1970s. And, and so I don't think it's just about safety um, in, the, in the West End. I think even if you had an affluent black neighborhood, you'd have certain Louisvillians who would not want to go to that neighborhood. I think that's more race mm -hmm. than it is about, about violence. Well, I'd like to thank you both for being with us. Clearly, this is a topic that needs something done. I think the point which was raised, why aren't we doing more to prevent things at the front? Um, it used to be said that uh, here in the United States, if you have a cliff where people are falling off, we'll spend millions of dollars to transport them by ambulance for trauma care rather than spending $75 to put a fence up to keep people from falling off that cliff. <laughs> and I think this is the classic example. I think we need to really start looking at the impact of trauma, particularly gunshot injuries, on our community and start doing something to identify the kids at risk and intervene earlier. I'd like to thank Bill, thank you for being here. Thank Ricky, you, once again, thank you. Thank you. I hope we have a chance to come back and talk about this in terms of prevention somewhere down the road. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at Kentucky Health at InsightBB.com and feel free to contact our guests. Thank you again. Look forward to seeing you on another segment of Kentucky Health.